being at peace with dukkha. And of course, as dukkha is a fundamental characteristic of life, you can be at peace in all situations then. Sa Bhagavatu Arahatu Sama Sambutasa Namo Tasa Bhagavatu Arahatu Sama Sambutasa Namo Tasa Bhagavatu Arahatu Sama Sambutasa Bhutang Damang Sangang Namasami So since uh, tonight it's uh, really the, the professionals here tonight, I can talk about a topic which uh, I wouldn't say is controversial, but is not so often talked about. It's not so uh, uh, palatable for the average person. But even though it is a very fundamental teaching of the Buddha, but in the uh, forest tradition, one of the, the sayings that one hears often is that uh, suffering is our teacher. Dukkha, dukkha is our teacher. And uh, while at first this may sound for some people a bit, I don't know, frightening, yeah, be a bit, uh, a bit uh, off-putting, whatever, but uh, if one takes this teaching to heart, one has a possibility to have some profound insights into the meaning of life. The majority of people, they spend a lot of resources, their time, energy, effort, whatever, uh, most of their life, running away from suffering. Whereas if one can transform it and change the, the, percep the perception rather than running away from it as something frightening, if one can take it as a teacher, then one can transform this fundamental uh, reality of life into something very, very transformative, it's very, very significant, very meaningful. And as we all know, the Buddha, you know, we're, we're quite fortunate to have the Buddha's teaching because the Buddha confronted suffering directly with teaching on the Four Noble Truths. But of course, I mean, it uh, requires a context. For many people, they don't have the right context for it. They don't know that suffering has a cause, has a cessation, and it has a path to cessation. Without knowing that context of it, then of course, who wants to you know, engage with suffering? Who wants to, to study it, to, to learn from it? It just is something very, very unpleasant. And, uh, there is this kind of a, you know, people have the, the, the illusion that uh, when they try to uh, either escape from it, ignore it, try to avoid it, then it'll go away. But, of course, we also know from the Buddhist teachings that dukkha is one of the fundamental characteristics of human life. So the kind of irony is that you try to run away from it, but you can't really run away from it because it is part of life. Even if you, you know, depart this life, apparently it still goes with you, they say. Unless you're an arahant, uh, who totally transcended all kinds of suffering. Otherwise it follows us even beyond the grave, they say. I don't know, that's what they say. 
I'll let you know when I, when I do leave, do depart this world, if I can. <laughs> so this Pali word dukkha, I mean, it's, uh, there's various translations of it. There's no really one English word which can really encompass the kind of depth and breadth of it in our, in our everyday relationship to it. You're probably just more familiar with the everyday discomforts of life, uh, the irritations, discomforts of having a physical body and maybe, a, you know, having a, to live in a, in a world with other people and you know, live with weather conditions, changing weather conditions. But it has a much more deeper meaning also because it is a, just a fundamental characteristic of life. So it's really pointing at the kind of uh, fundamental imperfection, incompleteness of human life. You know, our youth ends in old age, our life ends in death. You know, our life is incomplete unless we're able to factor in the ending of it too. So in the forest tradition, I mean, while they say that uh, 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 suffering is our teacher, and in, in Thailand, the, uh, technically, the forest tradition is referred to as the Tudong, Tudong Kamatana, the ascetic meditation tradition. By ascetic, it's sort of a, the word ascetic is also probably a little bit, you know, uh, not so easily received in the West. We were so familiar with comfort, but uh, you know it's referring to the Buddha's teaching about the middle way. Asceticism is not self-mortification, you know, but it's really, you know, it's it's also not you know, overindulgence in, uh, in in comfort. You can say maybe it's uh, asceticism is uh, trying to. Uh, stretch outside of our comfort zone, put it that way. We all have our own particular definition of what a comfort zone is, as far as uh, living conditions and, you know, having to relate to, to uh, other people, etc., you know, our, our certain space, whatever. But if we stay within the comfort zone, even we do, even we practice kamatana, meditation, by just staying within the comfort zone, it's still, you know, your, your meditation doesn't really stretch beyond yourself, really. You know, your, your comfort zone is self-imposed. It's set up, it's a, it's a kind of a defensive arena for yourself. This is my, this is my area, my, my domain of comfort to protect my, myself. The self you know, is, is founded upon well-being, sukha, say, rather than dukkha, sukha. And if, you're, if your self is not giving you enough sukha, happiness, well-being, whatever, then it's not, it's not successful. It's not, uh, you know, it's not, not uh, fulfilling its purpose in life. So while most people, they, they have a little bit of leeway, they can, you know, they can tolerate some degree of discomfort. But if it gets too much, then that's why some people commit suicide. Or they, or they, uh, they take intoxicants to completely zonk themselves out. So the Buddha, I think the Buddha was very aware of human feeling. It's one of the meditations on feelings, feeling tones, Pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. He's well aware of that. Yeah, so we need some degree of, of comfort. Yeah, some degree. But when does it become when does it become excessive? When does it become indulgence? On the other hand, and you know, the other side of it is the uh, you know self mortification. I mean, that was one of the practices which is common in India. And the uh, the Buddha, the Buddha even practiced that for many years, practiced these different self-mortifications because that was the, you know, the usual way of spiritual practice if you're serious. 
So there's stories in the scriptures about what the Buddha went through, you know, fasting and uh, uh, undergoing uh, the uh, living in the forest and freezing to death, well, not to death, but freezing, freezing cold and then boiling hot. And but the result of all that, for the Buddha anyway, was that he just felt weak and collapsed one day. You know, just to just sap his energy. And he didn't feel that this was the right way to practice. So then he, he created what they call the middle way, moderation between these extremes. And everybody has their own definition of what the middle way is. You know, the middle way is, it's, uh, well, you know, it's, it's quite, uh, say, subjective. What's, what's the middle? Huh? You can recognize what the extremes are, maybe. What's, what's the far right, what's the far left, but the middle, you got to kind of find out for yourself. And each person's a bit different. But in the, the forest tradition, they have this, it's called Tudong, which means, like I say, ascetic. But there's various practices you can follow to, you know, just again, not to mortify yourself, but to challenge your, your, uh, your comfort zone. You know, different ways of, of eating, different ways of sleeping, uh, different ways of clothes, but putting, using clo clothes, different lodgings. And sometimes just shifting that comfort zone a little bit gives you a different perspective on another aspect of yourself. I mean, some of these, these uh, ascetic practices one does when we practice here anyway, you know, eating out of the bowl, uh, eating one meal a day, and uh, the, the all night sitting. It's called, uh, it's, really, it's really the uh, not lying down to sleep for one night. And uh, we did this in Thailand too, every, every week actually in Thailand. We used to do it every week when we were younger. <laughs> And uh, when I was there, I used to quite look forward to it. Sometimes, anyway, at least, not in the not in the hot season because it was a real struggle to stay awake in the heat. But uh, but it was very refreshing in the winter time when it's cooler, and the long period of time sitting, walking, sitting, walking. You could build up a real mo momentum of practice. The only thing was that it did ha did have its side effects. Yeah, so usually the first day after the, the all-night sitting, uh, one was quite energetic. And then the second day, crash. <laughs> and we, everybody knew then, you know, that the second day, don't talk to people. Because everybody is irritable and grumpy. <laughs> so, <laughs> just understood, you know, that's... You know, that's the way it is, you know, that's the way of nature, the way of having a body. <laughs> but it, was very, it could be very revealing practice if you could turn it into a learning experience. You know, why, why, why are you so irritable? You know, why the body's tired and, you know, you're, you're just, you know, haven't got so much energy. So, ah, oh, you know, lack of energy creates a negative state of mind, a critical negative state of mind. Maybe normally you wouldn't notice that. You know, many people who stay up, they stay up all night because they you know, have a party or something, you know, and uh, they just uh, can enjoy it. You know, it's very, very exciting and interesting, but if you turn into a meditation, you can notice these changes. You know? All the, the energy levels can go up and down, up and down, and, and it affects your mood. So why, why are you so attached to you know, energy? To 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 uh, depend. What, what does your mood depend upon your energy level? Hmm? Not all the time you can have have a lot of energy. It's just uh, you know it's just common. Depending upon the weather, the food you eat. Uh, you know if you're if you're very busy or something. Well, sometimes the energy is depleted. And you know do you need does it need to affect your mood? Well, how's your, how's your mood so attached to energy level? You can understand that. You can maybe unhook 
And you can even out your moods. It's not so dependent upon just how much energy your body has. So the, the ascetic meditation tradition you know, is uh, designed to not torture us. I mean, sometimes they do say in the Thai language, they do say, uh, they do, do say it is toraman. <laughs> they, they say it is a bit of literally be that torture <laughs> to push yourself, but it's not really torture, and, you know, as a dictionary defines, but it is pushing yourself beyond your limits. And so something which, you know, Arjun Shah recognized the value of, you know, he would push people. And it was surprising, you know, how, how, much, uh, how much you could stretch outside your comfort zone. Yes, for example, in the early days at Wat Nanachat, and before going there to Thailand, I traveled in, in India and I... I had a bicycle, so I had, to, I had to study about nutrition, how to keep up my strength. So, uh, so I knew a lot about nutrition and vitamins and all this kind of this stuff, B vitamins and C and uh, protein and all this. So I went to Thailand, and as a monk, we don't have much choice over our, what we eat, over the food we're given, especially in what Nana Chat. It was, it was all communal, just served out. We sat in a big long line, and in the early days, there was so little food they had to. Some some of the monks had to walk down the line and dish it out, so people wouldn't take too much. You see, and I remember at least one time anyway, sitting there, and when the meal began, looking in my bowl, and there isn't any vitamin B, no vitamin C, no vitamin D, no protein. How do we survive? <laughs> but we did. <laughs> I thought, you, I thought we couldn't, couldn't survive without all these vitamins and protein and stuff, you know. But we did. The body was amazingly adaptable. I found out later that you know, most of us were malnourished, but, <laughs> but we survived, you know. You do a bit of relief sweeping for half an hour and you're <sighs> at the <to> rest. <laughs> then when Wat Nana Cha got more well known and the, the, the quality of the food increased, then we had more energy, you know. But we didn't die. You know? Nobody died there of malnutrition. <clears throat> but we wouldn't know this unless sometimes you challenge yourself, you know, how much can you get by on? And this is not just a, you know, a, a test of your ability to be a, a prepper or something. <laughs> They're going to survive the global meltdown or something or other, but, you know, to turn it into a learning experience. And we don't realize it, but we, in, our, in the course of our life, you know, our body adapts to certain habits, you know, like three meals a day, you know? The young baby doesn't eat three meals a day. You know, why do we, have we, in the West anyway, adapted to eat three meals a day? And then different cultures have different different rhythms to that too. Yeah. Remember going to, to Europe, you know, to, to, and in, in, in the Southern European countries, Italy and Spain, they, they, after the, mid, the midday, they, they have a long siesta. And they work till about 12 o'clock, nine to 12, and then they, everything closes down, then it starts again at four o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, I thought, this is crazy. <laughs> But actually, when you live there in that hot climate, you realize how, how, how wise that is. In the hottest part of the day, you have a rest. The only thing was, when I was you know, staying in the youth hostel, they closed the youth hostel, nowhere to go. <laughs> even though even restaurants were closed. <laughs> but we, we think our, our standard is normal. Yeah, and if we don't realize that, that well, then we build upon it a certain level of self. Yeah. And if our, if our, you know, I remember, you know, being in Europe and then thinking, you know, this is all wrong, Southern Europe, this is all wrong. They should do it our way, you know, do it my way. Like in Canada, has the best way to do it. 
It took me you know, six months of travel before I realized, oh, maybe other people have some better ideas how to live besides Canadians. <laughs> but we don't find out these things, you know, just how, how our self is so uh, linked up with and, and dependent upon our particular habit tendencies. Our, our sleep habits, our eating habits, our living habits. And, and it doesn't mean that we have to have, you know, it's, it's ascetic meditation tradition. So, I mean, it's not that we, asceticism is the main thing. You know, in, in the Buddhist time, a lot of these ascetics, they depended upon asceticism to create their state of mind. You know, if you, if you fast for a long time, of course you have samadhi, of course you have hallucinations, <laughs> Visions because you're you're you're, you're malnourished, yeah. but you know if you if you're using that this you know testing our comfort zone as a source of wisdom, then you begin to recognize you can see the sense of self. You know the what's being disturbed is yourself. Yourself doesn't like this. It wants to go back to its comfort zone again. So, you know, who is screaming there, you know, what is it? What is that self that's screaming away, wants, some, wants to return to its own particular habits, comfort zone? And you can just see how dependent that self is, how conditioned it is. So we, we have this Buddhist teaching about the, you know, the nature of suffering, you know, the Buddha defined it. You know, every morning you do the chanting, you know, Jati piduka, jara piduka, you know. Birth is, birth is suffering, old age is suffering. We'd be better to, to you know, probably a, a more appropriate translation is unsatisfactoriness. So it's a bit clumsy. Like I say, it's not just suffering because even, even happiness is dukkha. Because it's never permanent, it's not permanent. You get dependent upon being happy or seeking for happiness and it's not there and you suffer. But it's unsatisfactory. You can't say it's, it's, it could be gratifying. Well-being, happiness can be gratifying, but not totally satisfying in the end. It'll come to an end and we're disappointed. Then the Buddha pointed out the cause of suffering. You know, the, ca the causes, there's several mentioned, you know, we can say that very basically, ignorance and craving. Ignorance is really helpful to know about in this context because many times, you know, the, the reason we suffer, we just don't know it. We don't know the context for it. If you can recognize that this suffering, unsatisfactory, is a characteristic of life, then you can, you can open to it, you can receive it more. And when I came across the, the Buddha's teaching the first time and it mentioned about suffering, I was, I was I rejoiced, wonderful, you know, because I realized I was suffering. <laughs> I didn't know it at the time, you know, I just, I just was in the middle of it. But when the, when the Buddha said, oh, you know, there is suffering, then it provided this consciousness to be conscious of suffering means you're not right in the middle of it. Oh, there is this condition. And then there's a knower of it. Huh? You can be the knowing of the suffering. It isn't the same. But when you don't know that there's suffering, you're in the middle of it. There's, there's suffering, there's confusion. Am I, is it all just my fault? Is it, is it my trip? Is it what's happening to me? Am I, being, am I being punished by some deity or by bad karma or something? But you just know it, it's a condition of life, a characteristic of life. Aha! It's not my, not my fault in a wider sense, you know. Just part and parcel of being born. Jati piduka. Being born is unsatisfactory. So, I mean, you're, you're, if you recognize, okay, I'm suffering, well, because you're born, that's why. <laughs> it's not your fault. Don't blame your parents either. <laughs> so when you know there is suffering, 
That's a, that's a good relief already. You can just recognize it and acknowledge it. Okay, there it is. Then there's a cause of it. So then, then you, there's a possibility then to investigate. Yeah. Of course, you know, for many people, it's, if the suffering is, you know, too much, it's very hard to investigate. It's just, uh, you know, when, you, when you're being impinged upon by excessive suffering, no energy there to reflect upon it. So that's why the, the Buddha gives us, you know, for example, the practice of focused attention, samadhi. You know, this can provide a certain foundation, peacefulness of mind. You know, they say, you know, the, I, the, the traditional practice, develop concentration, develop the, they even talk about the four levels of, of, uh, of jhana, absorption. And then you, then, <clears throat> then you contemplate the four noble truths. This is suffering, this is, this is dukkha, this is the cause, cessation, the path to cessation. Of course, usually it doesn't happen quite so systematically. You know, when there's some calmness of mind, there's enough, enough space, like Ajahn Chah just said, when the mind is calm enough, then you can bring awareness to unsatisfactoriness. What is this? What's the condition of the body? Is it pleasant, unpleasant, neutral? There is some unpleasantness there. There is some dukkha there, dukkha vedana. Then look at it. Where is this coming from? Is this you know, physical tension? Is it mental tension? Is it emotional tension? And it gives us a little bit, better, bit more better perspective on it. You know, we, we know there is, it is part of the human condition, unsatisfactoriness, dukkha. You know, but what's, what's the deeper level of it? Just to say, oh, yeah, yeah, life, you know, some, some Buddhists just say, oh, life is suffering, yeah, yeah, go and put up with it. <laughs> but unless you know what the cause is, you aren't able to resolve it. Hmm? You notice that some of the, uh, the, the, the suffering in the body is just due to, to tension. Your, your body's all tensed up when you meditate. You're trying too hard. And relax a bit. And then you realize cessation of that kind of suffering. Of course, it probably requires, you know, this a much a more uh, continuous or deeper insight. Because it may be a habit. You know, if you're really a compulsive kind of person, then you, you kind of tense up with every kind of activity. It's just your, your habit tendency. But you notice in one situation, and then, oh, right, check it out with other situations. Do you, do you work with tension? Do you walk with tension? And sometimes just recognizing it, noticing it. Oh, this is, this is unpleasant. The suffering is unpleasant. Then relax. You can open to it, receive it. And the relaxation sets in just from the knowing. And you are the knower then of it. Not, not the beer of it, the knower of it. Just being conscious, conscious of this, these activities, uh, these processes in the body and mind, yeah, already sets in a certain amount of, of, of letting go happening. Some of it, of course, requires much more deeper investigation. There's not just one cause. There's a cause of a cause of a cause of a cause. So let's, you know, maybe a, a whole series of different levels of consciousness you have to waken up to. But it was quite a, it's quite a, a kind of a revelation in a way to being in Thailand because you know, before going to Thailand, I, I did, I studied about Buddhism, so I heard about the Four Noble Truths. And I thought, oh, Thailand's a Buddhist country, so they know about suffering, so maybe it'll be kind of a gloomy place, you know. Everybody's miserable because they all know about suffering. But when I got there, Thailand's known as the land of smiles. <laughs> Are these people kidding, kidding themselves or what? <laughs> no. But one time I met this man who was a, comes to the monastery, and I just asked him one day, how are you feeling? You know, just, it was 
common greeting in Thailand, you know, how are you doing? And he said, turned to me and he said, I'm suffering. <laughs> and I thought, oh, um, what do I, how do I answer that one? Then he just, he just kind of chuckled. I'm suffering, you know, big deal. <laughs> and I realized he had had the first insight of the, first, of, the, of the Four Noble Truths, you see. There is suffering, but there's a cause. And there's a cessation. And there's a path. That's why he, he was, came to the monastery. He realized this is the path to relieve his suffering. But how many people in the world know that? Yeah. How many people know there's a path out of suffering other than intoxication or, or <laughs> sensory indulgence? <laughs> of course, the path is, you know, that and the Buddha clearly defined the path, the Eightfold Path, yeah. Of course, putting into practice, you know, sometimes is not quite so easy to integrate it into our life. You know, we may have to change some of our habits, you know, change some of our, uh, outside of our comfort zone, you know, what is right speech? You, know, you have your usual way of speaking, but is that right? You may have to change that. Livelihood, you know. I know, I know some people who have changed, that have changed their livelihood. There's one man, he didn't have really wrong livelihood, but I, he was one of the supporters in Switzerland, and he had, he had a, a factory. He made uh, metal, metal work for, for other companies, for other machines. And he made quite a lot of money. Yeah. And he was very generous to us, the monastery, with his, with his extra money. But he realized, you know, it's, he's just working himself ragged. You know, and it's just, it's just a very left brain activity. So he decided he was, you know, he had enough money, I guess, to, to, to change jobs, sold his factory, and became a social worker. So he could work with, well, how do, what, do you, what do you say, that's a polite phrase, disadvantaged youth or something? Socially disadvantaged? In his, in his home, and he was, he was the, uh, he was kind of the grounds person. So he had these, I don't know, four or five, Young men disabled, you'd say, socially disadvantaged, whatever you say. But he felt really, really good to be able to help them, be their mentor and be able to help them and do something useful and bring out his compassion for them. You see. But before he was just working at this factory, you know, with with pieces of metal. <laughs> I guess there was maybe a certain amount of you know, satisfaction in making a correct piece of metal. Or a machine that worked, you know, but but he realized his heart was missing. His heart was not being nourished by this. So he took a, a big cut in his, you know, in his wages, but he really enjoyed this. It really opened up his heart, he said. He realized that's what he needed for his spiritual development. And this was when he was, you know, in his, I don't know, 40s or something, so you know, to make a big major life life change like that. You know, middle middle age, you know. but he realized that was what he needed in his practice. Now at that point, so as we begin to develop the eightfold path, we review it occasionally, and we come back, come, maybe come around to different. Even though it's the same thing we've heard, right livelihood or something, heard many times, but then we reflect upon it in a new way. What's what's the livelihood which will support my spiritual practice? Not a livelihood, it'll just make me lots of money, yeah, maybe also anxious and stressed out, but you know, what'll support my spiritual practice? And then we you know, put that into practice and then see if it is working, see if our, if our suffering is becoming less, declining is becoming less. That's the real test of it. You can say, well, you know, I'm, I'm going through the, what the book said, you know, do this, do that, but is it really working? Maybe you have to review it again. A lot of people, especially in the, in the West, we get quite attracted to meditation practice, yeah, usually in the form of samadhi, concentration exercises. Anyway, so you know, it's, it's kind of like, a, you know, our mind is usually very busy, so you know, concentration is peace of mind, 
calm your mind down, relax. Yeah, 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 that's what I need. But unless we, that's supported by wisdom, understanding what is the source of your mental disturbances, that's only a temporary respite. When you got the time to, to devote to periods of uh, formal, formal meditation practice, concentration exercises, of course, your mind will qual calm down, quieten down. But if you go back to a stressful life situation, it soon disappears again. And some people were able to you know, bring their, uh, their insights, as it were, bring their clarity of mind, as it were, and awareness to the work situation. You know, what's, what's causing all this? Why, why am I so stressed out about this? And perhaps they can just change their attitude. They don't have to take it so seriously. You know, just like realizing that, you know, suffering is just part and parcel of life. It's not your personal problem. It's not due to your bad karma. It's not due to your, you know, your, your evil deeds in the past or something or other, necessarily. Yeah. So you don't take it so personal then. Just having a physical body, having a mind you know, within this particular environment we, we live in, there's going to be, going to be some friction there. But you begin to recognize how much of it is just, we can say, is, is uh, say, say, uh, say, due to just the, 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 the situation you're in, how much do we create? How much do we add on to it? As Buddha said, there, you know, there's two kinds of feeling. There's one kind of feeling, like the, the physical pain in the body, and then the other one is mental. I don't want this physical pain. The physical pain in the body, that's, you know, that's just, that's the way it is. But you need to add on to it. I don't want this. It's hurting me. And fight with it, struggle with it. Or can you recognize, oh, you know, this is, this is the way it is. I have to be more patient with the body. Do I have to be, you know, make more, make some, some changes of posture. Or I have to, you know, find a new way of sitting or something. Now, one retreat I gave in Switzerland, there was a young man there, and he was, he was uh, you know, looked like he was a fit young man, but he had trouble sitting cross-legged. He, he, he was always fidgeting back and forth, and so on the interviews, I just, you know, asked him, how are you doing? You know, looked like he wasn't very peaceful sitting there. And he, he got really, really angry, just pounding his knees, you know. He had, he'd been in a, in a motorcycle accident, and had pins in his knees, you know, and he, he just and he and he hear these old ladies and whatnot sitting cross-legged. Here was a young man thinking he's going to be really macho and sit cross-legged, out sit them, <laughs> and he couldn't do it because he had this, you know, constitutional this weakness in his body. You know? So I said, you know, the the posture is not the meditation, you know. Just because you know you, you you can't sit there, you know sit sit in a chair or something. You know you have to maybe you have to humble your pride. <laughs> you are a young man sitting in a chair, and the old ladies are sitting on the floor cross-legged. But <laughs> but <laughs> you have to acknowledge that's your condition right now, the rest of your life. You know, it's limitation. I think after that he was more relaxed about it, but. Uh, so he had this fixed idea in his mind, you know, he's a young man and he should be able to do this. And, and you know, some people get fooled by, you know, the posture. And you know, the longer you can sit there looking like a brass statue, uh, the, the wiser you are. Usually those are the people who are the least wise. <laughs> they just got some willpower, but <laughs> probably a big ego too, you know, to show off. <laughs> This is my excuse for sitting in a chair. <laughs> I'm very humble. <laughs> or just a weakling, maybe. <laughs> 
too long, too long trying to be the macho meditator <laughs> and uh, wreck, <laughs> wreck my knees. But interesting enough, you know, there is a the uh, kind of uh, the kind of irony of the whole thing is that you know when you can acknowledge and be aware of dukkha, you're not frightened of it anymore. And once you realize, oh, this is the way it is, then you have a great sense of peace. You know, it's, it's, the, the, the arahants are the ones who know completely the Four Noble Truths. They know dukkha, the cause, cessation, and the path. That's all one has to know, really. Whereas, you know, the people who don't know that, they're running away from dukkha, they just keep running because there's no way out. The only way out is to uproot the cause of it. I mean, you have to go to it, know it, and go to the cause. So I saw my, my perceptions were that, you know, you know, here this dukkha is like the elephant in the room. And so many people, like especially in the West, don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. You talk about, you know, old age or death. It's one of the, one of the forbidden topics. You know. One of the most revealing events was, uh, was the cremations in Thailand, for example. You know, the cremations, people are, are they're, they're sad, of course, the person's gone, but it's not a really heavy feeling of dread about the whole thing. Where we're in the Western context, you know, people are, you know, people are wearing black, everybody's sad and really heavy and mournful, and you can't smile, of course, you can't smile at a funeral. <laughs> But in Thailand, it's almost like, you know, they, they people go there and they feel sad, but they're also with a sense of well-wishing, you know. This person's now on their journey now. They're, they're leaving. They're, they're, they're on a journey to car, of karma, a karmic journey ahead. You know? Maybe they also expect that I'll see you there next lifetime too, you know. <laughs> but as if, you know, uh, people are trying to, in, in, in the Western context, many people are trying to ignore suffering. But it's always there. So there's, there's a suffering which is there, which they haven't confronted yet. And then there's the fear of being confronted with it. Yeah. Or in the Buddhist context, once you are, acknowledge it, you're conscious of suffering, no big deal. Just another event on the horizon. Suffering, okay. Hello there, how are you? Acknowledge, it, acknowledge the elephant in the room and there's a lot more space. The elephant's right here, filling up the space. You acknowledge it, you can see right through it. <laughs> Just the way things are, you know. There is, there is dukkha. And it's got a cause, it's not, it's not like it's one big solid block. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, it's the, maybe, it's a, maybe it's just an inflated elephant. <laughs> just a balloon elephant. <laughs> and when you realize it's got a cause and a cessation to it, poof, yeah, not so solid anymore. Not something to have to run away from and be frightened of. Of course, it still has its, you know, its sting to it, right? You got to be careful not to take on too much of it. But that's uh, what, what, what the middle way is. Just recognize, okay, well, how much... You know, how, how calm is the mind, how, how, how settled is your, is your mind and your emotion, so you can now access it, look into it. Physical suffering, mental suffering, emotional suffering. Begin to try to investigate it from a place of calm, and you see it differently. Most people, they wait until the suffering is so bad that they can't ignore it anymore, then they just get overwhelmed by it. They get traumatized by it. But if you can t dip into it from a peaceful state of mind, even though many times we have a peaceful state of mind, you want to stay there. I don't want to disrupt it you know, with suffering. You know? But that's the best time to investigate it. Your mind will be stable, so you're investigating suffering from a stable place of mind, a uh, stable uh, condition of mind, and you're not not overwhelmed by it, not traumatized by it. Just a little blip on the, on the screen then.
There's one time when I was in, in England and I had this, uh, my, uh, had this fear come up, kind of irrational fear, you know. When fear comes up, I usually say, what am I frightened of, you know? I'm not frightened of the dark, I don't believe in ghosts, or, even though it was in a, you know, old house, old, I don't, could be haunted house. Nobody, nobody has seen ghosts there, actually. <laughs> Lots of ghosts in England. <laughs> This irrational fear kept coming up, and I just couldn't deal with it at all. And then one day, you know, I, I was I was sitting in a meditation hall, and there's, there's quite a few people there, 20, 30 people there, and then I just this fear was right there in my heart, and so I I just opened up to this this I just brought this fear into the room with me, consciously invited it in with all these peaceful people. And it wasn't so frightening. When I'm facing it by myself, it's terrifying. When inviting it into this room with 30 other people who are all meditating, yeah, not to mention the Buddha statue behind me, <laughs> and it wasn't so frightening. I wasn't alone with it. It's just, just a state of mind. And then when it came up later, oh, I saw, I now had this new experience of it. Or normally, I tried to keep it at bay, you see, <clears throat> until finally it overwhelmed me. And then it was just, it was terrifying. But uh, tapping into it, bringing it into this peaceful environment, totally different experience of it. It's like now it is just, just, just a little extra, an extra prop in the scene. Before, when it was just me and the, and, the, and the fear, it was overwhelming, it was a big monster. So when the mind is somewhat calm, you know, Lashen Shah says, calm enough. So if you can invite these, you know, these different aspects of dukkha into your meditation. Physical pain, if your mind is peaceful, you look at the physical pain, most of the time it's not so painful. Just a sensation in the body. Again, you have to recognize how much. If it's too much, you get overwhelmed, but if a little bit, it's, you know, there's, you're still with the, with, you're still the knowing of it from a calm mind and not the pain. If it gets too much, the pain takes over and dominates you. But you have to know, we have to know our limits too. And, you know, just tapping into it in a peaceful, from a peaceful state of mind and recognize we can more and more, we can begin to tolerate wider degrees, wider and deeper and broader areas of suffering in our life. And eventually, we recognize sometimes it's just gone, like this fear. After a while, it just kind of faded away. I couldn't say why or I couldn't say how. It just, after a while, you know, it wasn't frightening anymore. I'm just being conscious. There it is. That's this fear. That's just a state of mind, fear. Comes and it goes, comes and it goes. So once we begin to open to and recognize, you know, what uh, dukkha is, unsatisfactoriness, you know, we can realize the cause and its cessation. Yeah. And we can be more at peace, being at peace with dukkha. And of course, as dukkha is a fundamental characteristic of life, you can be at peace in all situations then. And I just hopefully you can, you know, continue with it right to the last moment, be at peace with death coming in. Uh, I hope I can do that at the end. <laughs> Work on little deaths every day, and then maybe the final one will be <laughs> it'll be somewhat similar. <laughs> so from this, if we can turn suffering into something we can learn from, it just becomes one of our greatest teachers because it's can tell us about the, the fundamental meaning of life. Because it is a characteristic of life. So we, we, we learn from it. We learn, it teaches us the fundamental, fundamental meaning of life. All things arise and pass away. And it's no, not a self. So with that teaching, I hope you'll be able to develop it and follow it and see the results for yourself. <laughs>